Canadian Super Sisters, Tegan, T- Tegan and Sarah are heading our way, armed with an enormous arsenal of joyous, uplifting tunes. <laughs> <laughs> and on stage chemistry and magnificent musical ability. Don't forget those pop sensibilities. They are Tegan and Sarah. Morning, Tegan. Good morning. How's what a ha- lovely introduction. Oh, well, it's a pleasure. I've, uh, it took me a while to work on it, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But it's uh, based on, well, admittedly, a little bit of research, uh, reading some stuff, but also listening to your your stuff for a number of years now. It's all there, isn't it? Pop sensibilities, and you can play your instruments well. <laughs> and you and your you and uh, Sarah, you get along well, don't you? Yeah, we do pretty good. Uh, we were actually saying last night that uh, you know I think that we we think we've gotten more healthy because we get along better and. Then we decided that maybe that that was what actually was very unhealthy about us was that after 12 years of playing in a band and 29 years of being twin sisters, we maybe we shouldn't be getting along so well. Maybe it's kind of creepy that we continue to have this life that's very conjoined. Yeah. I wonder what your relationship would be like with Sarah if you hadn't formed this band all those years ago. Yeah, I wonder too. I mean, I get stuck thinking about what it is that we would do if we weren't musicians and then my brain kind of, it's like trying to imagine what happens after you die. And my brain stalls up and then I get distracted and watch television. <laughs> yeah. Was there any other option for you? Were there other plans for a career? You know, I mean, Sarah and I never, it's funny because there's no real big story of like we decided we wanted to be musicians and then we set out to conquer the world. We really just finished high school and um, and convinced my parents that it was okay for us to take a year off before we went to university. And and uh, in that year, you know, we did a lot of traveling and a lot of playing music, and we met a lot of really, you know, key important people that changed our life. You know, we one of those people being Elliot Roberts, who manages Neil Young, but also manages or managed at one point, you know, Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell and. Mm. Um, and so many other amazing artists back in the 60s and 70s. And he thought we had talent and thought that we should take more than a year off and we should pursue music and signed us to a a five-record deal, and here we are. So um, That must have changed your life completely. I mean, obviously. We're here 11 11 and a half years later, and it's definitely changed our lives because, you know, we... uh, Instead of signing, you know, like to a regular record label and and having two records to prove ourselves, instead we had five records to to make music. You know, Elliot Roberts' feeling was that you know people don't really truly make their best music until they're in their thirties because you know you need your twenties to create some life experience to write about. And um, so instead of worrying about record sales, Sarah and I went out on the road and started traveling all over the world and touring with other artists like the Killers and Ryan Adams and Neil Young and the Pretenders and gaining all this life experience in the meantime and writing more records and and here we are you know with our uh where are we the con is album number five isn't it the con was album five and sainthood which we just put out will technically be record six so after record five we signed to warner and and um and here we are making you know bigger records and touring more places and singing to more people, but ultimately the goal is the same, you know, just to make music. Yeah, sure. It, uh, see, someone like that rather than perhaps, well, you know, somebody else, somebody who, who like Elliot, who's worked with those people from the past, uh, that it's very important, I guess, for you guys to have had this mentor. I think so. I mean, I think that's potentially what's lacking for a lot of artists or mm. maybe just in terms of like, you know, vision for bands is like this idea that it will take time. You know, everything in our world has become so immediate, including music. And we want our pop stars to look at, like, you know, I mean, I love the whole, like, I I love everything that's happening with Lady Gaga because I think she's such an intelligent, progressive, outspoken person. But, you know, she put two records out in one year. And, you know, a lot of the pop stars that are becoming very famous, it's the same thing. It's like the labels are just frantically putting out as much music for, you know, a band that's popular as they can because then society will move on and pick someone new next season. And I think that that works for some people and that's necessary for some sort of acts. But for a band like Sarah and I that are truly musicians and songwriters, you know, it really doesn't make any sense for us. And so someone like Elliot absolutely is still uh, integral in this business because he's enforcing this idea that, that some music will take time to develop and, and I think that's the kind of audience that we attract. You know, mm. when I look out in our audience, I see people that have been with us for 10 years and are still following our band. We're sort of like the soundtrack to their lives at this point. Yeah, interesting to see if uh, one day you go buy a burger and there's Lady Gaga flipping, <laughs> asking you if you want fries with that. I hope not. Mm. But 
but you never know. I mean, like, there's so much music that's changed in the last, you know, 10 years to, like, or so many artists that were popular when Sarah and I started that are, you know, are no longer relevant. And, you know, things move quick, and, and Sarah and I know that, you know, so we don't take anything for granted. You know, we always just assume this will be the last record that anyone will want to hear, and then and then we finish that record, and it's bigger than the one before, and so here we are again, you know. It's kind of like touring. We love Australia so much, but every time we come here, I'm like, well, this might be the last time we have to take advantage, and then here we are again, yeah. and it's bigger and better, so it's great. You must be doing something right, and in fact, uh, because people do keep coming and seeing you and, and buying your records. It's it, true. In, in fact, th- this whole Canadian music scene, we've got a bit of a love affair with it here at RTR FM, Wolf Parade, as I, I just played there. I'm, yeah, I'm, fantastic I'm, band. Yeah, and I'm featuring the new Broken Social Scene record this week as well. Yep. Is it as, as cosy and supportive and collaborative as, as we think? Well, definitely some music, like some of the scene is, is really close-knit. Um, you know, bands like Broken Social Scene and Feist and um, Metric, and a lot of those bands are all out on the East Coast in Toronto and Montreal. So um, a lot of those bands are really, um, you know, familiar or they, you know, collaborate and play together. Sarah lives in Montreal, so, you know, she's very, um, you know, she's friendly with bands like Broken Social Scene and um, Arcade Fire and that sort of thing. I'm on the West Coast, so, you know, that sort of more... Um, isolated and so I don't know um, as many of those bands the way that maybe Sarah does or that they know each other but you know we have bands like the New Pornographers and yeah. You Say Party We Say Die and a, a bunch of other really amazing Canadian acts so I mean I think that there's like a there's there's definitely a kinship between Canadian bands I mean there's a camaraderie it's um, it been a lot easier in the last few years for a band like us or you know, a band like Broken Social Scene to break all over the world. You know, the internet, while it's brought lots of bad things, it's brought some really amazing things too. It allows bands like us to have, you know, international exposure without huge marketing budgets and, and label support. So we're able to exist in many different places without um, a ton of support. And, um, and that's been pretty amazing because I remember when we first started you know, touring around the world and there was none of those bands. I mean, I remember the first time we played on Letterman in the States and a radio person called me the next morning and was like, you're one of the only Canadian bands that's ever played on Letterman. And I was like, really? You know, we didn't have Wikipedia. You couldn't, like, look that stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, TV and then online, it, it gets you out there, doesn't it? But it must be the best time is up on stage, isn't it? I think so, yeah. I mean, I think most artists would agree. I, I guess all of them except the ones that hate being on stage. You know, there are yeah. some artists that are terrified to be in front of people, but... For most of us, yeah. I mean, I love getting up on stage. It's definitely the part of the day where I feel, I don't know, maybe my, my the purpose of what I am doing is most clear to me. You know, mm. Sarah and I have struggled over the years with the concept of, like, individual, like, lives and autonomy and what it is that we're brought here to do. And, and sometimes being on stage is, is that really clever and, you know, very clear reminder of what it is that we are truly here to do, and that is to entertain and um and especially, you know, now that we've been touring for so many years, I look out in the audience and I, I see people and they seem really touched by what we're doing and seem really genuinely happy to have us back. And, and we appreciate that, you know. We work really hard to make new records and to get over to places like Australia and it's pretty great to stand on stage and see the genuine joy on people's faces that were there. Yeah, it must be. I'm speaking to Tegan from Tegan and Sarah. Gosh, you're eloquent. By oh, the, thank you. By the way. <laughs> That's nice of you to say. <laughs> That's okay. It, it does, it's a bit of a generalisation, but it does seem to be a Canadian thing to uh, to be able to speak so well and off, uh, frequently. And uh, yeah, well, I definitely have met a lot of um, a lot of people, like a lot of musicians, over time who don't enjoy the process of speaking about their music or their band. But I think um, that is yet another part of the process for Sarah and I is um, being able to talk about music allows me to get a better understanding of why it is that I do what I do. <laughs> yeah. We're going to see you this Friday, uh, Tegan, over here uh, on the West Coast uh, once again. You're at the Fremantle Arts Centre. Yep. Uh, it's a beautiful venue. A uh, couple of supports there too. The Jezebels and Astro Nautilus yeah. will be with Tegan and Sarah. Thanks for talking to me this morning. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for, for having this conversation with me. <laughs> <laughs> conversation. Learning is good. <laughs> And meeting people is nice. Excellent.